Welcome back to TTC and welcome to our first episode of our flashlight work light testing series that's been around three months in the making. In this episode we're building the testing rig, testing the lights and putting them on a new rank list but obviously most of these episodes in the future will get right into the testing. Just like on our air hammer series these won't replace the bread and butter impact testing that we do on this channel but we want to sprinkle them in from time to time because we use lights a lot when working on cars and maybe you do too. Or at least maybe you're curious who's selling you a load of BS in the lumen specs. We'll be taking light suggestions in the comments below, so leave those if you like. We plan to do a handful of a certain type of light per episode in the future. On our impact series, we shine some light on and maybe bust some myths about impact wrenches and drivers, but if you thought exaggerated torque claims on impact wrenches were bad, oh man. You should see lumen ratings on lights nowadays. This is a $18 Dr. Pepper work light. That's 700 lumens. Flashlights are probably the worst though. $28, 90,000 lumen flashlight. That would take like 1100 watts to run and it would probably set your hand on fire before a light that size ever approached 90,000 lumens. And all these flashlights advertising as high lumen, but no actual specs, what's high? So on this series, we're going to test inspection lights, flashlights, small floodlights, really anything you guys suggest that will work on this rig, from professional to DIY brands to see what's what and how they stack up against each other. So of course that means measuring their lumen output, but we're also going to test practical things like run time, charge time, magnet strength, and show you how they work. In order to do the tricky part of this testing, the lumens, we bought this Everfine light inspection sphere for about $5,000 in this Haas 2000 spectrometer and software to run it for $21,000. Eh, just kidding. But we did send that lab we're showing here our samples in order to calibrate our own integration sphere, which we made for a few hundred dollars using a data logging light meter, a foam sphere, and some chemicals straight out of Breaking Bad. So let's get into it. When we pulled you guys on our community page during a 24 hour period several months ago, about what lights you thought were sort of top shelf and want to see tested, your top three answers were Snap-on, Streamlight, and Astro. So we picked up all three. Our goal with this initial episode isn't to sort of catch brands red-handed with their advertised lumen numbers, more just get everything working like it should. So we'd hope that these brands offered powerful and perhaps honestly rated lights that we can then judge all the others against after calibrating this new testing rig. But we won't be taking the word for it. We went with three different light types so that the lab's data sent back to us would help us calibrate our own cheapy light integration sphere for different types of lights we'll eventually be buying and testing. In order of lumen output, first we have the Snap-on 400 lumen mini ABS floodlight or project light. We purchased this because it's popular and we wanted a mini floodlight in the range, but to be honest, mainly because it it's $51, and that's one of the cheaper ways to step off the Snap-on truck with something in your hands. Next up is the Streamlight. You gotta go flashlight from them. We went with the 500 lumen ProTac 2LX USB model 88083 because it's extremely highly ranked in the reviews and sales on Amazon, and we had to go with a rechargeable 18650 style battery because we didn't want any fluctuation between a CR123 style battery between the lab's testing and our own testing. Last for Astro, we went with a 65SL, which is at the time of us purchasing it, the highest sales rank light from Astro on Amazon. It advertises 650 lumens from the main light, 120 lumens from that top light, and that gives us an extra data point to calibrate our rig by having two different lumen levels. A nice bonus. So we packaged these up to send them off and got started on our own light integration sphere in the meantime, DIY style. So here's our smooth foam hollow sphere. This is basically like fancy styrofoam and a smoother, more paintable surface. Our first step was to paint the inside of this sphere to reflect light as well as possible without being sort of shiny, like glaring. Our first attempt was to just pour in and sort of let it work around evenly. That worked pretty terribly, so we used foam brushes. This is a brilliant white paint that's popular among projector geeks for having a high numerical rating when it comes to criteria like a white scale or reflectiveness and luster. 
This worked in our initial light testing after sort of painting it on, but it was not great. So we went Breaking Bad style and after applying another paint coat to get the surface tacky, we spread this stuff called barium sulfate on it, which is supposed to be about as pure white and reflective as you can get in powder form. We dusted it on, which worked poorly. Then we retried this process with a powdered sugar sifter, but ultimately this was just as bad in testing. So we got another sphere and this time mixed that brilliant white paint with the powder we're using and an agitator for about half an hour, then painted the sphere with that. This stuff went on super thick and gloopy, so it took a few coats to get the surface finish even. Happy with that for the time being, let's show you how we made some holes in the sphere and what they're for. Our first small hole is for the light meter itself. Heating up a razor blade makes quick work of foam like this. We'll be attaching the meter through this porthole right here, and for the meter we bought an Xtech HD450 NIST certified calibrated data logging light meter so that we can hopefully remove as much potential for error as possible, at least on this piece. It reads in lux, up to 400,000. As for lumens, we're getting to that, and it's sort of the purpose of this light integration sphere. So back to the least exciting glory holes you'll ever come across. The next one goes in a very specific angle and location versus the measuring hole. And this one is sized for a small floodlight, project light like the snap-on, and can also be used with flashlights. The last sort of rectangular hole here is for stick style inspection lights like this 6.5 SL and gets covered up here with white then black tape while it's not in use. Now fast forward about two months, back from the lab we got our three lights. We can get into those tools, details, materials of construction and more in future episodes when we compare them against what else is out there and the multi head to heads will do. But for now we're interested in those lab results. And once we saw those lab results, we knew while we had a consistent setup already that we could use math to provide you guys an accurate picture of these tools lumen output, but we were close to something even better, a golden ratio, if you will. Something that if we tinkered with and got our rig just there, when watching these videos, you guys without math would be able to witness and see this lumen level a lot easier. So we installed a short white divider inside the sphere, sort of here to eliminate the bleed over from the light source versus the reading on the light meter. But what really did the trick was lightly sanding the paint slash barium sulfite finish with sandpaper to knock down that luster inside. After these steps, we felt we had it. So let's take a look at what we had. Just as a glimpse inside of this thing, when the light is shining in here, it's really like staring into a deep white abyss. It's really trippy. Take a look at this thing. So up first is a 65 SL stick light. We'll do the tip flashlight first. We cut out these thick white card stock cards to sort of seal up the opening for flashlight tests like this. And our sphere got a bit of an update with some fancy aluminum legs and a plate to sit in. Real professional like. Anyhow, they rate the top light at 120 lumens. The X tech meter is down here below, which I'll backlight in a second. The meter measures lux, remember, and it's currently set up to range in thousands of lux. So it's seeing about 1.14 or 1140 lux here. Keep that in mind. Now let's get to the main attraction, the Cobb LED main light, which they rate for 650 lumens. According to the same light level testing process Streamlight even puts on their box, you need to wait 30 seconds before you measure max output on lights like these. So after the 30 seconds and getting to the backlit portion here, that's 6.7 or 6.75, meaning 6,750 lux that the meter is seeing here. So maybe you're seeing a pattern we're trying to show you. But before we get carried away, let's finally look at one of those Lumen Lab test reports using the light integration sphere and software that's in a whole nother league than ours. So along with a bunch of other info that's interesting, what we're after here is the 65SL's top flashlight lumen level, which shows to measure 127.3, and the main light measures 675.5. And if you'll recall, we were seeing 6,750 lux, or 6.75, on the meter display. Okay, a little off with the top light being 1.14 versus the 127, 
but that's a pretty dim light source to begin with. As you can see, we're kind of coming close to a 10 to 1 ratio between lux on the meter and lumen level in reality. Let's take a look at how the Snap-on ABS project light rated at 400 is doing. So waiting for that 30 second interval and holding down the power button on the Snap-on light to make sure it's in high, then shielding the light around the already pretty snug opening hole and backlit display, 4.19 or 4.20, 420 lumens maybe. Let's see, our lab report shows 427, definitely a win for our fifth grade science fair looking contraption. Last up, and hopefully not spoiling our fun, is the 500 lumen streamlight. And it dons a new card cut out and waits 30 seconds. So we're seeing 4.91, 4.92. Crossing our fingers and looking at this lab report, that's 492.7 lumens. And our gauge was reading 492. So we'll take it. In case you're worried that we're only at 500 lumens, the meter going up to 400,000 lux means with our golden 10 to 1 ratio we're showing here, we could do a whole lot more and initial testing with 1,000 and over lumen lights looks good so far. But we're not just testing lumen output on this episode series, although we are pretty excited about that. We'll also be doing lots of other metrics that they try to sell you on, but few people actually put to the test, like runtime. The Astro is rated for two and a half hours of runtime, the Snap-on the same two and a half, and the Streamlight is rated for three and a quarter hours when using the 18650 version like we have. So let's see if those stack up, and here's a time lapse. So the 65SL clocks out at 2 hours 38 minutes, very on point with the 2.5 hour claim. The Snap-on exceeded it a bit with 2 hours 55 minutes and the Streamlight lasting a very long time, but we gotta say the camera is compensating here for brightness or darkness in this case. Up to and much beyond 4 hours the Streamlight was very faint and almost useful for nothing at all. Testing it again down to 40 lumens, this light lasted 3 hours and 50 minutes, still well beyond the 3 hours they advertised though. We're starting to feel like these brands are actually playing a pretty honest game. Then again, we tried our best and our viewers who responded in our poll tried their best to use respectable examples for this first episode. Next is charge time. Charge time's a biggie for us. Time charging means time we can't use this thing to be making money. In many cases requiring us to have to buy two of the lights so that we're not stranded in a dark engine bay. None of these lights advertise particularly quick charging but ones that do can save you from having to buy an a whole additional light. We're using this USB gizmo that sort of tracks the volts and amps delivering to the light, total battery capacity, and of course, charge time. The Snap-on is up first, which advertises four hours of charge time and a 2000 milliamp hour cell, not very big, but it did last almost three hours and make 400 lumens in our sphere, so sounds pretty conservative, let's see. Looks like it's accepting 0.6 to 0.7 amps from that 5 volt 1 amp charger. So total it took, let's see, 3 hours and 50 minutes, right on with their claim of 4 hours, but the cell charged up to almost 2200 milliamps, so more than the 2000 that they advertise. Onto the stream light, the actual cell on the flashlight comes out of the light, and a micro USB sticks right into it, which is pretty cool, but it looks like it's only asking for around half an amp from our charger, that's not a lot. Then again, looks like the fine print on the stream light shows a whole five hours to charge this thing. Yikes. Almost five hours in, this thing is still charging, the red light on the top still lit. It's over 2600 milliamp hours on the cell already though, that it advertises, but still accepting a quarter of an amp. So the battery's finally showing green here, fully charged, let's take a look. Five hours, 15 minutes, 
and that's 2,685 milliamp hours. Five hours and 15 minutes is most of a work day. If you're taking this camping fully charged, that's likely fine, but using it day in and day out, you'll probably be missing it a lot when it's charging. Let's see how the largest battery in the bunch, the 65SL does. They advertise a big 3,200 milliamp hour cell, which takes four and a half hours to fill up, according to them. But looks like it's accepting around 0.85 amps from the one amp charger it comes with. The only light here that came with a wall adapter, actually. Charge level indicator lights are full, let's take a look. A whole five hours practically, but it did reach 3,300 milliamp hours, so that's, that's a lot. At 675 lumens, it appears it needs all of that battery capacity. For the lights that do have a magnet, we also cooked up something quick for that. Basically a quarter inch steel plate with an eye threaded onto it for a pull force gauge. The Snap-on's base magnet measures between nine and 10.5 pounds. So we'll call that 10. Magnets are pretty important for us. There's not always a good place to stand up or balance a light on. So slapping it onto a firewall or frame is pretty convenient. The stronger, the better on non-flat or dirty surfaces. The 65SL measured between 15 and 17.5 pounds, so we'll call that 16. They call it a 20 pound magnet, but there's a lot of different surfaces and thicknesses you could probably test this on. The steel plate we made we think makes sense though. So onto the rank list to see how these three lights stack up. For now, all three lights are on the same list, but obviously we'll be doing future episodes as head to heads between multiple lights of the same category, flashlight versus flashlight, stick inspection light versus another, etc. Here we have the image, brand, and model numbers. Battery size is first up, actual measured battery size, not what's advertised. That gets turned into points by dividing by 50, so that's 43.7 for the Snap-on, then 53.7 and 64. Then we award points for charge time. This is a function of battery size. The quicker it charges that battery per milliamp hour, the higher the points. All these are one amp max charged, but some charge faster per size of battery than others. That's 28.5 for the Snap-on, then 25.5 for Streamlight, and 33.3. Runtime is obviously important. The runtime in minutes is divided by 5. That's 35 points, then 46, then 32. Runtime and charge time is compared to what's advertised here in percentage. The Snap-on ran 16% longer than advertised and charged 4% quicker. That's an average of 110% or 110 points. Then 104 and 98. But all these performed at above or roughly at their advertised time. So pretty impressed there. Then we got magnet strength. Not all lights have a magnet. If it's a flashlight versus a flashlight, maybe both won't. Or an inspection light versus an inspection light, maybe both will. But either way, these pounds are turned into points here. The light output we measure will be turned into points. Then the honesty of those figures get turned into points here in an even more dramatic fashion, which is sort of the point of this light testing series. Really to see who's lying because it would really be easy to put big numbers on the box with no one really being able to check. The 65SL had two lights, so its total lumen output is versus total advertised. Then we have lumens per dollar. Those are turned into points here with Snap-on and Streamlight getting quite similar and the 675 lumen 65SL being a bit higher here. That totals 407.1, 409, and 457.6 out of a theoretical 600. Of course, none of these will be competing against each other, so we're not ranking them here. Three different lights, but they all seem to perform quite well, in our opinion. They each have their own pluses and minuses, like Snap-on being ABS plastic and brands loving to leave out that charger, but we plan to get into those details when we do future episodes of whole categories. We're interested to hear from you guys what modern rechargeable lights are your favorites or maybe your theories on most exaggerated. Stay tuned if that sounds interesting to you. Thanks for watching.